Once we have designed our tetrahedra, we can label them by coloring at the edge, at the, at the vertices of each, and a yeah, different color can be used to represent a different substituent. So in this case, all four of the substituents are identical. So we might imagine that the orange uh, refers to hydrogen, and that this would be a model of methane. And as we have seen before, the point group of methane is the point group of the tetrahedron, which is point group TD. So now let's see if we can lower the symmetry to find other chemically important subgroups. So what we can do is replace one of the substituents with a green atom. So now we've changed just one of the substituents and we want to see what the point group of this particular uh, molecule is going to be. We might think of this as something like uh, CH, uh, Cl3 or CH3Cl, so maybe methyl chloride. We consider this to be a chlorine substituent and these sort of reddish brown pieces to be hydrogen. So then this is methyl chloride. Now, we no longer have the S4 that we had before, so if we try to do S4 here, and we do a rotation, and we flip around to the, to the front, we're not going to, it's not going to be identical, because originally we had two oranges in front, and if we do this now, we have a green and an orange in the front, so we no longer have the S4 operation. What we are left with is, if we look along this particular angle, that we still have our C3 operation, so the high order rotation axis for this particular case is going to be C3. And this is a classic example of the point group C3V. Uh, it, it, another extremely important inorganic compound of this type we can use to represent ammonia. In this case, we would consider the central atom to be hydrogen, uh, to be nitrogen. The three substituents that are orange would tend to be hydrogens. And the green we can think of as being the lone pair. So this is a nice way of representing the point group C3V, which is a subgroup of TD. Can we do anything else? Yes, we can. If we have two substituents of each type, so we have two greens, so we can see our two greens, and we have two oranges, this might be a way of representing a molecule such as CH2Cl2. So we have methyl chloride, or methylene chloride, dichloromethane. And in this case, we've reduced the symmetry by quite a bit. We no longer have any C3 axes anymore. And what we're left with is point group C2V. And one way we can, we can kind of visualize that is we turn it this way. Whenever we get this sort of Mickey Mouse ears arrangement where we have two ears of the same type and then the head is down here is a different type, this is very commonly going to be C2V. So we can also think of this as modeling water, where each of these is hydrogens and the central atom is oxygen, and the two greens are two lone pairs. So we can use this to represent either a substituted uh, methane, where we have two different substituents and we have two of each, or we can use it to represent such molecules as water. So again, this is another important subgroup of the tetrahedron, and this is point group C2V. And we can do many, many combinations. But one last one is extremely important. We can have a situation where we have four different substituents. So we have four different substituents. In those particular cases, now as far as a point group symmetry goes, this has no symmetry other than the identity. There are not even any mirror planes in this case because it's not a planar molecule. So this will give us a symmetry C1. But what's also important about it is we, there's two different possible arrangements of the four substituents. So we can also make another compound here. And what we want to do is to see if we can arrange them so they line up, and they do. If we look this molecule versus this molecule, each one is the mirror image of the other. Now, they're not a mirror image of themselves, so they don't have a mirror uh, symmetry operation, but they are mirror images of each other. And these types of molecules will exhibit an extremely important uh, phenomenon, which we call chirality or handedness. Uh, one physical manifestation of this chirality is that each of these two molecules will have exactly the same boiling point, uh, the same melting point, virtually the same chemical properties, except how they will interact with plain polarized light. 
if, for example, this particular molecule would rotate plain polarized light by 20 degrees right, then we know that this particular molecule would rotate plain polarized light 20 degrees left. So each of these will rotate plain polarized light in the opposite direction. Again, this was a part of Van Toff's analysis of substituted methanes and correlating this structure to the possibility of having optical activity, chirality, how the molecule will interact with plain polarized light. There is a second important consequence to this type of arrangement, and that is how this particular molecule will react with biological systems. Biological systems tend to differentiate between the two different handed versions of the same molecule. So in very many cases, it might metabolize one and not metabolize the other. One might be very beneficial and the other one might even be poisonous. So the body can distinguish between these two different handed versions. So the many, many uh, important medicines have this phenomenon, have one or more of these so-called chiral centers. We have a carbon atom around which we have four different substituents so that it will interact with plain polarized light so as to rotate it in one direction or the other. Uh, we can also use these types of molecules as a training tool for students. To distinguish between the two-handed versions, we use a system called the Kahn Ingold Prelog system. And the, the way of determining it depends very much on a sequence of rules in how we uh, rank the priorities of the various different substituents. Well, using these types of tetrahedra, a student is free to write or change the colors of the different substituents and then practice determining whether it's right-handed, rectus, R, or it's left-handed, S, sinister. So it's a very effective tool, among other things, in practicing the uh, assignments of uh, optical activity based upon the Kahn Ingold prelog system. So this is all we have for episode seven. Next week, we'll continue with episode eight. Have a good one.